Book seven, Ethan Dune, The Last Charge. Away in the waste of White Horse Down, an idle child alone played some small game through hours that pass, and patiently would pluck the grass, patiently push the stone. On the lean, green edge forever where the blank chalk touched this turf, the child played on alone, divine, as a child plays on the last line that sunders sand and surf. For he dwelleth in high divisions, too simple to understand, seeing on what morn of mystery the uncreated rent the sea with roarings from the land. Through the long infant hours like days he built one tower in vain, piled up small stones to make a town, and evermore the stones fell down, and he piled them up again. And crimson kings on battle towers, and saints on gothic spires, and hermits on their peaks of snow, and heroes on their pyres, and patriots riding royally that rush the rocking town, stretch hands and hunger and aspire, seeking to mount where higher and higher the child whom time can never tire sings over White Horse Down. And this was the might of Alfred in the ending of the way. Where of such smiters wise or wild, he was least distant from the child, piling the stones all day. For Eldred fought like a frank hunter that killeth and goeth home, and Mark had fought because all arms rang like the name of Rome. And Colin fought with a double mind, moody and madly gay, but Alfred fought as gravely as a good child at play. He saw wheels break and work run back, and all things as they were in his heart was orb like victory, and simple like despair. Therefore is Mark forgotten, that was wise with his tongue and brave, and the cairn over Colin crumbled, and the cross on Eldred's grave. The great souls went on a wind away, and they have not tale or tomb, and Alfred, born in wantage, rules England till the doom. Because in the forest of all fears, like a strange, fresh gust from the sea, struck him that ancient innocence that is more than mastery. And as a child whose bricks fall down, repiles them o'er and o'er, came ruin and the rain that burns returning as a wheel returns, and crouching in the firs and ferns, he began his life once more. He took his ivory horn unslung and smiled, but not in scorn. Endeth the Battle of Ethandun with the blowing of a horn. On a dark horse of the double way he saw a great Guthrum ride, heard roar of brass and ring of steel, the laughter and the trumpet peal, the pagan in his pride. And Ogier's red and hated head moved in some talk or task, but the men seemed scattered in the briar. And some of them had lit a fire, and one had broached a cask, and wagons, one or two, stood up like tall ships in sight, as if an outpost were encamped at the cloven ways for night, and joyous at the sudden stay of Alfred's routed few, sat one upon a stone to sigh, and some slipped up the road to fly, till Alfred in the fern hard by sat horn to mouth, and blew. And they all abode like statues, one sitting on the stone, one halfway through the thorn hedge tall, one with a leg across a wall, and one looked backwards very small, far up the roads alone. Gray twilight and a yellow star hung over thorn and hill. Two spears and a cloven war shield lay loose on the road as cast away. The horn died faint in the forest's gray, and the fleeing men stood still. Brothers in arms, said Alfred. On this side lies the foe. Are slavery and starvation flowers that you should pluck them so? For whether it is better to be prodded with Danish poles, having hewn a chamber in a ditch, and hounded like a howling witch, or smoked to death in holes, or that before the red cock crow, all we the thousand strong go down the dark road to God's house, singing a Wessex song. To sweat a slave, to a race of slaves, to drink of infamy? No, brothers. By your leave, I think death is a better ale to drink, and by all the stars of Christ that sink the Danes shall drink with me. To grow old cowed, 
To grow old cowed in a conquered land, with the sun itself discrowned, to see trees crouch and cattle slink, death is better ale to drink, and by high death on the fell brink that flagon shall go round. Though dead are all the paladins whom glory had in ken, though all your thunders sordid thanes with proud hearts died among the Danes while a man remains, great war remains. Now is a war of men. The men that tear the furrows, the men that fell the trees, when all their lords be lost and dead, the bondsmen of the earth shall tread the tyrants of the seas. The wheel of the roaring stillness of all labors under the sun speed the wild work as well, at least, as the whole world's work is done. Let Hildred hack the shield wall, clean as he hacks the hedge. Let Girth the Fowler stand as cool as he stands on the chasm's edge. Let Gorlias ride the sea kings as Gorlias rides the sea. Then let all hell and Denmark drive, yelling to all its fiends alive, and not a rag care we. When Alfred's word was ended, stood firm that feeble line, each in his place with club or spear, and fury deeper than deep fear, and smiles as sour as brine. And the king held up the horn and said, See my father's horn, that Egbert blew in his empery, once when he rode out commonly, twice when he rode for venery, and thrice on the battle morn. But heavier fates have fallen, the horn of the Wessex kings, and I blew once the riding sign, to call you to the fighting line, and glory in all good things. And now two blasts, the hunting sign, because we turn to bay, but I will not blow the three blasts till we be lost or they. And now I blow the hunting sign, charge some by rule and rod, but when I blow the battle sign, charge all and go to God. Wild stared the Danes at the double ways, where they loitered all at large, at that let, as that dark line for the last time doubled the knee to charge and cut their weapons clumsily and marveled how and why in such degree by rule and rod the people of the peace of God went roaring down to die. And when the last arrow was fitted and was flown and the broken shield hung on the breast and the hopeless lance was laid in rest and the hopeless horn blown, the king looked up and what he saw was a great light like death. For our lady stood on standards rent, as lonely and as innocent as when between white walls she went, and the lilies of Nazareth. One instant, in a still light, he saw our lady then. Her dress was soft as a western sky, and she was a queen most womanly, but she was a queen of men. Over the iron forest he saw our lady stand. Her eyes were sad without an art and seven swords were in her heart, but one was in her hand. Then the last charge went blindly, on all too lost for fear. The Danes closed round a roaring ring, and twenty clubs rose o'er the king. Four Danes hewed at him, hallowing, and Ogier of the stone and sling drove at him with a spear, but the Danes were wild with laughter, and the great spear swung wide. The point stuck to a straggling tree, and either host cried suddenly as Alfred leapt aside. Short time had Shaggy Ogier to pull his lance in line. He knew King Alfred's axe on high. He heard it rushing through the sky. He cowered beneath it with a cry. It split him to the spine. And Alfred leapt over him dead and blew the battle sign. Then bursting all and blasting came Christendom like death. Kicked of such catapults of will, their staves shiver, the barrels spill, the wagons waver, crash, and kill the wagoners beneath. Barriers go backwards, banners rend, great shields groan like a gong, horses like horns of nightmare, neigh horribly and long. Horses ramp high and rock and boil and break their golden reins and slide on carnage clamorously down where the bitter blood doth lie, where Ogier went on foot to die in the old way of the Danes. The high tide, King Alfred cried, the high tide and the turn! As the tide turns on the tall gray seas, see how they waver in the trees, how stray their spears, how knock their knees, how wild their watchfires burn. The mother of God goes over them, walking on wind and flame, and the storm cloud drifts from city and dale, and the white horse stamps in the white horse vale, and we all shall yet drink Christian ale in the village of our name. 
the mother of God goes over them on dreadful cherubs born, and the psalm is roaring above the rune, and the cross goes over the sun and moon, endeth the battle of Ethan Doon with a blowing of a horn. For back indeed disorderly the Danes went clamoring, to warn to take anew the tale, or dazed with insolent and ale, or stunned of heaven, or stricken pale before the face of the king. For dire was Alfred in this hour, the pale scribes witnesseth. More mighty in defeat was he than all men else in victory, and behind his men came murderously dry-throated, drinking death. And Edgar of the golden ship he slew with his own hand, took Ludwig from his lady's bower, and smote down Harmer in his hour, and vain and lonely stood the tower, the tower in Guelderland, and tore out of his tiny boat whose eyes beheld the Nile wolf, with his war cry on his lips, and Harco born in the eclipse, who blocked the Seine with battleships round Paris on the isle, and Hakon of Harvest Song, and Derek from the Elbe slew, and Nut that melted Durham Bell, and Folk, and Fiery Oscar fell, and Goderek, and Siegel, and Uriel of the Yew, and Highest sang the slaughter. And fastest fell the slain when from the wood road's blackening throat a crowning and crashing wonder smote the rear guard of the Dane. For the dregs of Colin's company, lost down the other road, had gathered and groaned and heard the din, and with wild yells came pouring in, naked as their old British kin and bright with blood for woad, and bare and bloody and aloft they bore before their band the body of their mighty lord, Colin of Caleron and its whore that bore King Alfred's battle sword, broken in his left hand. And a strange music went with him, loud and yet strangely far. The wild pipes of the western land, too keen for the ear to understand, sang high and deathly on each hand when the dead man went to war. Blocked between ghost and buccaneer, brave men have dropped and died, and the wild sea lords well might quail, as the ghastly war pipes of the gale called to the horns of the white horse vale, and all the horns replied. And Hildred, the poor hedger, cut down four captains dead, and Halmer laid three others low, and the great earls wavered to and fro for the living and the dead, and Gorlias grasped the great flag, the raven of Odin torn, and the eyes of Guthrum altered for the first time since morn. As the turn of the wheel of tempest tilts up the whole sky tall, and cliffs of wan cloud luminous lean out like great walls over us, as if the heavens might fall, as such a tall and tilted sky sends certain snow or light, so did the eyes of Guthrum change. And the turn was more certain and more strange than a thousand men in flight. For not till the floor of the skies is split, and hellfire shines through the sea, or the stars look up, through the rent earth's knees cometh such rending of certainties as when one wise man truly sees what is more wise than he. He set his horse in the battle breach, even Guthrum of the Dane, and as ever had fallen fell his brand, a falling tower o'er many a land, but Girth the Fowler laid one hand upon this bridal rein. King Guthrum was a great lord, and higher than his gods. He put the popes to laughter. He chid the saints with rods. He took this hollow world of ours for a cup to hold his wine. In the parting of the woodways, there came to him a sign. In Wessex, in the forest, in the breaking of the spears, we set a sign on Guthrum to blaze a thousand years. Where the high saddles jostle and the horse tails toss, there rose to the birds flying a roar of dead and dying. In deafness and strong crying, we sign him with the cross. Far out to the winding river, the blood ran down for days when we put the cross on Guthrum in the parting of the way.